We've already had uh, two excellent talks that set the stage. Um, artificial intelligence is about making machines that do the right thing. Uh, and up to now, that's meant machines that optimize expected value. It's the same definition we see in economics, in control theory, in statistics, in operations research. And the field of AI, if you read the newspapers these days, you might think AI and deep learning are synonymous. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, which is just one of the subfields of AI, along with robotics, planning, natural language understanding, and so on. Uh, but having said that, deep learning has contributed to some very rapid progress uh, in particular areas. Uh, perception being one example. So there's a competition called the ImageNet competition, which looks at the ability to recognize objects in 1,000 categories uh, in photographs downloaded from the web. And in that competition, computer vision systems have rapidly reduced their error rate over the last few years. The human error rate is around 5%. In 2015, uh, machines slightly exceeded that error rate. Uh, in 2017, they are now down around 2%. So they are substantially better than a human who has spent several weeks training to recognize these kinds of objects in images. That's a very, very significant achievement in AI. Here's a, a robot in our lab. This is Brett, the Berkeley robot for the elimination of tedious tasks. Um, and you'll often see in the media the claim that sensory motor tasks are actually very difficult for robots. Uh, and here we show that Brett can fold towels just as well as anyone else. And in fact, Brett will be in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London uh, this year, and he'll be folding towels for tourists who bring their laundry into the museum. Uh, this is Lisa Doll. He's uh, one of the world's greatest Go players, and as many of you know, uh, he was defeated by AlphaGo last year. Um, and what you may not know is that more recently, uh, AlphaZero, which is a non-Go specific version of AlphaGo, uh, in the space of 24 hours, uh, learned to play Go much better than AlphaGo, and therefore much, much better than any human being, learned to play chess better than Stockfish, which is by far better than any human being at chess, and also learned to play Shogi better than any program or any human being. So in the space of 24 hours, it became the undisputed world champion of three different uh, and very difficult and well-studied board games. So when we look at the state of the art now, uh, my former student Andrew Ng has a, a nice rule of thumb, which is roughly that uh, any task that an ordinary person can do in roughly one second is a good candidate uh, for an AI system to be able to automate. We also have now uh, increasingly capable physical platforms, so robots with uh, legs, with arms, with hands, uh, with wings, or rotors. Uh, and when you put those two things together, uh, for example, you can build things like self-driving cars. There are many more applications that are going to be coming down the pipe uh, as these capabilities mature. Uh, one of those is the digital assistant, uh, not the shopping assistant that we have in Alexa or Siri, uh, which is really a glorified interface to a search engine, but actually something that can read your emails, understand your conversations, keep track of all your activities, your relationships with people, uh, and serve as a personal assistant in the same way that any senior executive or government official has a personal assistant to make their lives run uh, on time, so to speak. Now, um, we often see, with my apologies to, to Kevin, uh, who said data is a new oil, uh, data is really the new snake oil. Um, the, I the idea that uh, somehow that, that just the, the number of exabytes that you have in, in your database uh, dictates how much power you have over the universe uh, is really nonsense. Uh, and it's going to be particularly falsified because the newer machine learning algorithms that are starting to uh, be developed actually use far less data because they're able to take advantage of knowledge that they've already um, acquired from other sources. Humans learn 
uh, new categories of objects from one or two examples. They do not need millions of examples. So with better learning algorithms, we will need far, far less data uh, and just quantity of data, the size of the population of your country, for example, as some people say, China's going to win the AI race because they have more people, right? That's really not the case. Uh, another thing we have to worry about is uh, exaggerated expectations. Uh, if one of the major bets uh, turns out uh, not to work, for example, if self-driving cars uh, end up not being uh, deployed and not being successful, not safe enough for people to buy uh, in the next five years or so, I think we'll see that the disappointment could create a significant backlash uh, against AI in general. And this has happened before in the 60s, it happened in the 80s, uh, and so we have to be tempered in our expectations. Now when we look at uh, the city in particular, there are two ways that these technologies have impact. One is that uh, just the advent of various uh, applications of AI, such as self-driving cars, are going to have a direct impact on the city. And then there's also the use of AI in the management of the city itself. So can we have intelligent cities? This has been a dream, uh, at least since the 1960s, uh, that we can use intelligent control systems to run our cities much better uh, than we have been doing. So when I look at applications of specific technologies, for example, the self-driving car, what does it do to the city? Uh, one thing is it dramatically reduces the cost of transportation. In talking with Uber, uh, they estimate a tenfold reduction in the price of an Uber trip. So it effectively becomes free to move around the city. Uh, you can go anywhere at any time for effectively no cost. Uh, that's an amazing change uh, in the way cities will work. We can also uh, no longer, we, do we need to own a car, right? We don't own electricity power generating. We just use electricity by plugging into it whenever we need it. And it'll be the same with transportation. We'll just use transportation services the same way we use electricity. So we will have many fewer cars owned in cities. We won't need to park them because they don't belong to us. We don't care which car we're riding in. Um, and there's really no reason for it to sit in a, in a parking place waiting for us to, to finish our work and go home. Um, and also, maybe even counterintuitively, uh, it enables mass transit systems to function better because they don't need to be fed by uh, people driving to a, a station in a suburb and then taking a train, uh, you can use autonomous vehicles to provide feeders for mass transit systems, which are much, much more efficient in terms of the volume of people that can be moved through any given linear uh, space. Uh, another area that's uh, really taking off now is 3D printing. Uh, I was at HP the other day, and they're, they're heading towards a system that prints one billion drops per second uh, at a resolution of around 10 microns. So that's coming down the pipe. Um, this is incredible technology. And not just plastic, but metal, glass, semiconductor. Uh, the, the scope for inventing just new kinds of physical objects that could never be made before is unbelievable. Um, and in fact, there's a reasonable possibility that as in some science fiction books, for example, in the Diamond Age, that we will be able to make things at home. Here are some examples, uh, a cast for a broken arm, a shoe, this is already for sale from Adidas, uh, an entire bicycle, uh, nice uh, decorative objects made out of glass. So we could make all this stuff at home, meaning we don't have to have shops anymore. Uh, we don't have to have Amazon delivering stuff to us. Uh, we just have a printer in the basement. Anytime we need a physical object, a light bulb, a pen, uh, we just print it. And we go down to the basement and pick it up. So that could train, change dramatically how things are produced, how things are distributed. Uh, the logistics industry, warehousing uh, goes away. Uh, it may also dramatically reduce the cost of physical objects. Um, and would also, I think, change the resilience of cities. Because if every house is effectively a general purpose universal factory, uh, it can make your city much, much more resilient. Services are also important. This is actually uh, the Dubai municipality front page showing all the services. And this is really coal to Newcastle, as we say in England. Newcastle is the center of the coal mining industry, so bringing coal to Newcastle is kind of a waste of time. 
it's kind of a waste of time for me to be telling Dubai about how to use AI in running its government services. It already is uh, and is really uh, impressively efficient. But of course, there will be greater opportunities uh, as, for example, we develop more intelligent conversational systems to use that AI technology uh, to make services better. Uh, employment maybe is not such a rosy picture. Uh, I think it's very hard to say exactly what the timeline is going to be, but I agree, uh, as Kevin also mentioned, that we will see a very significant elimination of many of the kinds of jobs uh, that we have been doing for the last 200 years. And the reason is, quite simply, that we have been using humans as robots. And if you use humans as robots, and then you have a robot, of course, you can use the robot for that job. Um, so if you were writing science fiction a 1,000 years ago, and you said, in a 1,000 years' time, most people will go to a building, and they will do the same thing 10,000 times a day, and they will do that 10,000 days in a row, and then they will retire and die. You would say, that's an insane picture of the future. No, no human race. We will never, ever do that. But we did it. We did it. That is, the, that is the life that we created for ourselves, and now we're upset that it's going away. We shouldn't be upset that it's going away, but we should prepare uh, for this very, very dramatic change. So some people say, well, that's fine. We'll just retrain everyone to be a data scientist. Um, so this is one image of the future, but I think this is completely infeasible. The world does not need one billion data scientists. I don't even think the world maybe not, doesn't need more than 10 million data scientists. So this is not a feasible future. In fact, if you do the math, when all the basic material needs of the world's population are met by a very small number of humans running automated factories and, and uh, machines providing most of those um, goods and services, what we are going to be doing is directly working with each other to improve each other's lives. And that, that could be a wonderful future. It's a very fulfilling life, uh, and it's also uh, fulfilling for your life. You will have a better life, and you will be giving other people a better life. But the trouble is that we just aren't very good at it. There are some gifted individuals who are fantastic at inspiring, at consoling, at teaching, uh, but we have no science base. We don't really have an education system that, that knows how to teach people to do this very well. So we have to dramatically retool uh, our uh, educational systems and our economy to, to work towards this future. Now let me talk about the second ap uh, application of AI in cities to make the city itself an intelligent system. Now as I said, this is an idea going back to urban dynamics movement of the 1960s. Uh, and more recently, we've seen the phrase, the smart city. Uh, it's become very politicized. Uh, people talk about you know, neoliberal arrogance uh, in uh, applying a very technological mindset to the management of a city. Um, so I'm a technologist, and I really have no alternative but to think about this in technological terms. Um, but what I want to uh, see is, OK, how do we do it? How do we make a city into an intelligent system? Well, if you open the textbook uh, in chapter two, it says, first of all, figure out what are the sensors, what information comes in to this intelligent system, uh, what are the actuators, what does this intelligent system do to the world, what acts can it, uh, can it do, um, what is the environment in which it operates, so what does it operate on, uh, where is it working, uh, and then what is the performance measure? How do we know that the system is doing the right thing or the wrong thing? So I'll go through each of these in turn, and we'll see, I think, where the problem has arisen. So why has this technological vision of the intelligent city not really uh, been realized very successfully? So when we look at sensors, I think the picture is, is pretty good. We now have cameras everywhere, probably too many for, uh, for some people's taste. Um, we have uh, the cell phone, so wonderful applications to allow people to report potholes or complain about garbage, uh, fix the roads, and so on. Um, we have satellite imagery, so you can see how things are going in terms of economic activity at night or uh, urbanization, land use, and so on. Um, you have the Internet of Things, which gives you real-time information about pollution, uh, garbage, all kinds of stuff like that. So, um, this is a really fantastic success story, and that 
makes it possible to do a lot of things that we couldn't do before. On the actuation side, oh, sorry, I wanted, I wanted to mention one thing. Um, it's very important to understand that we'll never have perfect observability of the city. And you don't want there to be perfect observability for the city. Because uh, a lot of what matters um, should remain unobserved by, uh, by the city. The time that you spend with friends, uh, that's really important to you, but that isn't the, the business of the city. Uh, in fact, most of what makes life worth living is not going to be observable to the people who are running the city, and that's a very important aspect of the city control problem that has not been appreciated enough. On the actuation side, it's interesting to look at the different time scales. In the short term, on the minute to minute scale, we have things like traffic controls, uh, pollution alerts. Uh, on the medium scale, you know, we can fix the roads, we can issue permits, uh, we can actually engage citizens in conversation uh, to learn more about their needs and complaints and so on. Uh, in the long term, we can make zoning decisions, investment in roads and buildings, schools, hospitals. We can change tax rates. Uh, we can also make new laws. We can modify our education system and so on. So all of these timescales have to operate together successfully. The environment that the intelligent city is operating in obviously consists of things like you know, the systems that have to be controlled, the transportation system, water distribution, power, and so on. Uh, and then there's just the physical environment itself, the parks, the rivers, the, the buildings, uh, the economic activity, the weather, which can uh, affect how things work in your city. Uh, and then there can be unforeseen events that can occur, earthquakes and storms. Uh, and so one of the jobs of the intelligent city is to be resilient against unexpected events. But I think the thing that's often left out in these models is the humans. So if you think about it, suppose all the humans were gone. Would your city work? Not at all. Okay, so we have to put humans into the model. Suppose all the humans were there, but we wiped their memories. So they didn't remember who they were, they didn't remember what their job was or how to do it. Would your city work? No, it would completely fall apart. So we have to model not just the people, but what they know. Suppose we allow them to know what they know, but we make them all speak a different language. So now in a city of a million people, you have a million different languages. Would your city work? No. So we have to model the communication among people as well. And we are nowhere near being able to operate models or even construct accurate models on that scale that include people, what they know, and what they communicate to each other. And without those things, you're not really modeling your city at all. Now let's think about the performance measure. What is it that the intelligent city should care about? Well, it should care about the happiness and well-being, and there have been many talks uh, at this summit uh, on this question. And I think my summary of all those talks is, it's pretty hard to define exactly what we mean. Um, one of the things that people have been doing uh, with cities and with airports uh, and all kinds of other services is to get feedback on performance. So if you've been to Heathrow or, lots, or airports in China, and as I think in Dubai as well, they have these little buttons uh, so you can press about how happy you are with the service. They don't provide a hammer, which is the right way to express your feelings in many cases. Um, but that is a, it's a good thing. It's better than nothing, for sure. But we don't want to confuse the quality of interaction with the city with the quality of life in the city. So for example, you may have a very nice interaction with the planning department. You, you, know, you get your permits very quickly, uh, everything works very smoothly. Um, but if you're surrounded by huge, ugly buildings all the time and you have no sunlight, then your quality of life in the city is really bad. And there isn't a button for you to press saying, I'm really miserable, it's so dark and, and I'm, I'm dwarfed by giant skyscrapers and so on and so forth. There is no button for that. Um, and one of the failings of the technological mindset, I think, has been the idea that uh, 
we can specify the objective and then optimize around it. And the problem is we cannot specify the objective correctly. As I said, happiness is really hard to define, and we don't get to uh, have enough feedback even to see how happy people are. And when you optimize an objective that's missing some of the things you really care about, right, you have a real problem. So if you ask the automated taxi to take you to the airport as quickly as possible, if the automated taxi doesn't understand the other parts of the objective that you didn't mention, like you know, don't kill anyone on the way, uh, you know, don't, don't attract the attention of the police, right, this is the problem. You will find the automated taxi driving at the maximum physical speed that the car allows. So this is just a metaphor, but I think it illustrates the point, the problem of optimizing uh, an objective that doesn't match the reality of what you care about. And so uh, my advice here is be explicit about the uncertainty that you have in the objective uh, and work with that uncertainty uh, as a key part of decision making. Uh, and this is particularly true as AI systems get smarter. So, I think it's inevitable that AI systems are going to, at some point in the future, be able to make better decisions than humans. By which I mean simply that they will take into account more information, uh, and just like AlphaZero, they will look further ahead into the future uh, and be more accurate. Uh, and that causes a problem. So now you have systems that are effectively more powerful than humans, but somehow we need to make sure that they never have any power. And that almost sounds like an irresolvable paradox. So do we have utopia, as some people predict, or do we have the end of human race, as other people predict? And I'm not sure. Um, now, the, this problem was anticipated actually quite a long time ago. Norbert Wiener is a very famous mathematician from the uh, middle of the 20th century, and he said, we'd better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Now, this could have been said by King Midas, who was a legendary king of Greece, who asked the gods, I want the, everything I touch to turn to gold. He got exactly what he asked for, and then he discovered that when he tried to eat, his food turned to gold. When he tried to drink, his water turned to gold. When he touched his family, his family turned to gold. So he died in misery and starvation. So this is the King Midas problem, and we face this problem with AI. If we put the wrong objective in, uh, we face an irreversible uh, and possibly catastrophic future. So let me just illustrate this in, in miniature, just to show you how important it is for the AI industry to get this right. Okay, and, and uh, Roman talked about the possibility that we will see uh, increasingly significant catastrophic failures of AI. Um, so here's your robot looking after the kids at home. And you're really busy and you have to stay late at work. And the kids are very hungry and there's nothing in the fridge. And the robot, you know, knows it has to feed the kids. It also likes to save money. And um, then it sees the cat. So um, unfortunately, you know, when this kind of thing happens, it's going to be in the news. And when that kind of thing happens, that will be the end of the domestic robot industry. Right? So there's a very, very strong incentive for the industry to solve this problem. And what is the problem? The problem is a misunderstanding of human values. Right? The nutritional value of the cat is significant, but the sentimental value of the cat is much greater. Uh, and machines need to understand that to avoid this type of mistake. So um, I'm actually in the process of trying to change the definition of AI. Up to now, as I said, it's been systems that optimize an objective. And I think this is simply a mistake, because we don't know what the objective should be. And instead, uh, we want to build systems that are explicitly uncertain about their objective, but their objective is directly tied to human preferences. We want to build human-compatible AI, we don't want to build cockroach-compatible AI. Uh, we want human-compatible AI. We also need to be concerned about the effect on us of building these kinds of systems. One way of looking at this is in education. 
if you look back over history, it's a back of the envelope calculation. We have spent about one trillion person years in teaching and learning. One trillion person years. Now, why have we done that? Is it fun? Do people just love going to school? Maybe not. Um, we do it because without that, we could not propagate our civilization. And we have no alternative because brains up to now have been the only place to put that knowledge. But now we have machines. We can put that knowledge into machines instead. What happens if we do that? What happens if we stop putting it into people and, putting it, and put it instead into machines? Well, then we get the future described in the Wall-E movie, where everyone becomes fat, lazy, and stupid, uh, and uh, effectively unable to propagate their own civilization. Uh, this is not a future that I recommend for humanity. So to summarize, rapid progress is happening in AI, and it will continue to happen. And it'll have an increasingly large impact on our society. We have to make sure that that impact is beneficial. Uh, and when I look at the particular case of the city, I believe it is possible for that impact to be extremely beneficial. But we have to be aware of several things. One is overconfidence about the models that we use for representing and controlling the city. Uh, and in particular, that humans are the most important part of what makes a city function. Uh, and as yet, we don't have good models of that part of the city. The second thing is to beware of overconfidence about the objectives. We do not know how to specify what the city should be optimizing, uh, and therefore we have to have different types of decision-making algorithms that take into account the uncertainty in the objective. And finally, we should beware of AI having the effect of enfeebling human society. It should be empowering us, it should be enabling us to live better lives, but it should not be enveloping us so that we can no longer function uh, as an independent species. Thank you very much.